All right, everyone, welcome to the macro invertebrate identification portion of the Michigan Clean Water Corps Volunteer Stream Monitoring Program. Um, if you are just joining, um, there were lots of great talks this morning and they're all being recorded. And so you will be able to see those later if you need to. Um, but we have a full hour and 15 minutes. So I'm going to jump in and get started right away. So my name is Tamara Lipsy, and I'm an aquatic biologist with um, the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Um, I've been with the department for 18 years, but I recently inherited the responsibilities for the MICOR representation from Marcy Noel Wilmis. She's still with us here at Eagle, um, but in a different capacity. So in addition to my aquatic biologist duties, I am now excited to be able to work with volunteers across the state. Um, what I do in my aquatic biologist life, other than work with all of you, is I assess water quality of inland lakes, streams, and rivers all across the state. I'm in the Lake Michigan unit, so a lot of times I'll focus on um, Lake Michigan watersheds, but I also help with other watersheds throughout the state. And macro invertebrate ID is a large part of what I've done for the past 20 years. Um, so I really do love them in addition to fish and I love teaching others about them. So hopefully you will enjoy them as much as I do. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that the Volunteer Stream Monitoring Program is one of three programs that are under, under the MyCore umbrella. The other two are the Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program and the Volunteer Stream Cleanup Program, which is primarily um, a grant program where we give out grants to local units of government so um, volunteer stream cleanups can occur. And you can find more information on our website about uh, all three of these programs. I also want to remind everyone that we do have a question and answer function. Um, to save time, I'm not going to take verbal questions, but Paul will be monitoring the question and answer. And he'll um, answer them if he can simply, or he'll interrupt me from time to time to cover some of the questions. And then um, I think we'll have time for questions at the end as well. Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, since Paul has already covered why we sample aquatic macroinvertebrates, I'm going to jump right in with how we classify or order them so that we can begin to identify them. Um, as many of you probably know, all living things, including plants and animals, are ordered according to a classification system. So and the example I have here is that I'm an animal. So my kingdom is animalia. Um, my phylum is vertebrata because I have a backbone. And I am a mammal. So my class is mammalia. Um, my order is primates. My family is homonidae. And my genus species is homo sapiens. Where a mosquito is also an animal is in the kingdom animalia, but it doesn't have a backbone, so it's in the phylum arthropoda, and it is an insect, and it's in the order Diptera and the family Hulicidae. And I have question marks where the genus and species are because um, there's, there's several of them. Um, but for my core purposes, usually class, order, or family are um, the classes that we need to go down to. So the purpose of this slide is to point out um, some terms that I'm going to refer to throughout the presentation and hopefully my laser pointer will work. Mm -hmm. So um, these are terms that I'll use throughout the presentation, but also will be useful to you when you start using your macro invertebrate identification keys. Um, the three major parts that we talk about most often are the head, the thorax, 
and then the abdomen. Um, and these are two different examples of um, macroinvertebrates with those terms. So the head is pretty obvious most of the time, but uh, there are some orders where the head is not obvious and that's actually one of your clues. Um, we often talk about the antenna or the eyes or the labrum, which is their part of their mouth parts. Um, and then the thorax is three pieces and they're usually referred to as the pronotum, the mesonotum, and the metanome. And I won't refer to those much today, but again, if you're looking at keys, um, they often refer to those when you're looking at maybe the, the um, leg that attaches to the pronotum, you're supposed to look at that tarsal claw. Um, so that's the purpose of them. Um, I might take up top about claws and then I'll spend for the abdomen, I'll spend a lot of time talking about what processes are coming out of the end of it. I'll refer to them as tails or um, circe or gills and so on and so forth. So there are many, many, many resources and when I was um, getting ready for this presentation, I actually got lost a little bit in the rabbit hole because there's so much, even since the last time I've looked, of what resources out there there are out there for macroinvertebrate identification. I found out there's two apps that I'm going to play around with this summer. Um, so you can try those out if you are more app um, focused. There's um, a couple of keys online that you can print out. Um, I put at the bottom there a couple of um, books that are keys that are really um, useful. And then um, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History has this website called um, macroinvertebrates.org. And I use that a lot for the development of this um, presentation. Their pictures are just phenomenal. Um, they have the first page start as this, and then you simply click on what you think your macroinvertebrate that you're looking at looks like, if you don't know um, even the orders at all. And then you can go down from there. And it also has a key that you can start using. Um, I found one spot where I got a little um, tripped up, but that's always the case usually with keys. So. Um, I really recommend using this website. So learning your bugs, as uh, Paul covered earlier, I often call macroinvertebrates bugs, even though it includes more than just insects. But really, um, it's practice, practice, practice. Um, and I suggest you collecting them for fun. Um, it's part of every vacation for me, and sometimes every walk at a stream that we go by a stream. I'm picking up rocks or picking up leaves and looking at the vegetation and my kids are really used to it now and they have learned a lot themselves. So that is, I recommend finding your favorite reference materials, taking with them with you on vacation or when you're out and about on the weekend and just collect some for fun. If you really want to get more in depth, you could consider taking a college course or find a local expert. And better yet, you could get a local expert to volunteer. Um, I will note there are several of aquatic biologists like myself here at Eagle, and um, we, are, we all do a lot of macroinvertebrate identification. And so um, if your particular organization doesn't have an expert or needs another one, you can contact me and I'll see if one of our biologists has some availability to come help you or maybe even Zoom with you and um, help you walk through some things. So the goal today is really just to introduce all the required MICOR group identifications, just so you know uh, what you're getting into. And then by the end of the year, hopefully you'll be able to identify these groups at least to the order level. And as Paul mentioned earlier, earlier, if you can ID things to the family level, you get even more information about um, 
the sensitivity of the aquatic macroinvertebrate community in your stream. And so maybe in the future, you could consider learning them down to the family level. So Paul showed you this list earlier. This is the list of individual, individual orders or families that we're going through today. Um, they're listed here from most sensitive to least sensitive. I won't go in this exact order because it made more sense to keep some of the orders together for this presentation, um, even if there are certain families that are more or less sensitive than others. So we'll get started here, but I want to just kind of show you the general layout of the slides that you'll see. Um, at the top, I will always um, show you the phylum and the class and the order will usually be bolded along with the family if the family part is um, important. So we're going to start with the order Megaloptra. And there are two families and they have different pollution sensitivities. One called the family Corydalidae has a pollution sensitivity of zero, where the family Cyalidae has a pollution sensitivity of four. So these are two different sensitivities. Um, this Helgramite um, or Corydalid is um, the most sensitive one on the list. Both of these families have these lateral projections, and then they also have three pairs of legs. Um, but the Corydalid at its tail end or its anus doesn't have a single tail. It has these little things called prolegs, which actually help it um, stay on wood, woody debris, and other things that it clings to. Um, it's generally larger than the Cyalid. Um, the Cyalid has these projections, but it has a single tail, not those prolegs. And I have the two sizes here because just to remind you that the Cyalid usually is much smaller. I haven't seen it much bigger than a half inch, maybe where the Corydalid can get up to three inches or more. So here's a real life picture of a Helgramite um, or a Dobson fly. Fish fly are also in this, um, in the Corydalidae family. Um, here's an adult. I'll show you an adult on each of the slides as well, um, which was kind of interesting for me because I don't often pay attention to what adults look like. I'm so concentrated on what the larvae look like. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, these uh, have do have jaws and they do pinch and they can get pretty big. So just use, make sure you use your forceps when you put them in a jar because they can pinch. The alder fly is a uh, more delicate at, at, um, as a larva. Um, and as I said earlier, they're much, much smaller and I'm never worried about getting bit by them. Our next order is um, the Plecoptera order or stoneflies, which is one of my favorites. Um, stoneflies are very pollution sensitive. And so because of that, you're usually in a really nice stream when you find them. Um, in addition to them just being, they're usually pretty larger compared to some of the other things you find and um, they just have some neat features. All of them will have two tails coming out there anus of their the end of their abdomen. They'll have two tarsal claws on each of their three pairs of legs. Um, they always have long antenna and then they have gills that you can see sometimes. Um, sometimes the, you can find gills on the thorax. So as a reminder, the thorax is this first three segments after the head. So sometimes you'll see gills on the underside of the thorax, but you'll never see them on the abdomen, which is important because mayflies also have gills, and but theirs are usually on the are on the abdomen. Uh, stoneflies are often found in gravel or on cobble and wood. 
There's many kinds that you might find in Michigan. And so um, here's some examples of those. All, many of these pictures came from that macroinvertebrates.org site. Um, you can zoom in on different body parts on that website to see things more closely. This Terranarsid is my favorite, um, probably my favorite macroinvertebrate. I have one on my shirt that I got from a conference. Um, I just think they're kind of neat. They have this armor on their three thoracic segments um, and just can get pretty large, which is why they're called giant stonefly, I'm sure. Um, and then uh, perlids, you'll find probably the most often. They're often kind of colorful and pretty, so we call them pretty perlids. And then some of them don't have um, gills, like the perloded does not have any gills. The chloroperlidae does not have any gills. Um, I believe the Taneopterygidae doesn't have any gills, although I've never seen one of these in person. And I think it's because they are a winter stonefly. And so in order to see them, you have to break through the ice to get them. Here are some views of the gills. Um, so I wanna show you um, a video of the gills um, and what they do with them. So stoneflies need a lot of oxygen. That's one of the reasons they're so sensitive. And so because they need a lot of oxygen, sometimes they will move their bodies so that water will flow over the gills so that they can get more oxygen. And this video is an example of that. Okay, moving on, the caddisfly order or Trichoptera. Um, they have a pollution sensitivity of 3.2, so they're still fairly sensitive. They have three pairs of legs like insects do. Um, they're a little more worm-like looking than um, the stoneflies. Many of them still have these plates on their thorax, um, but some do not or they're really hard to see because they're kind of see-through. Um, they have prolegs at the end of their abdomen, which help them cling on to things. And there's often, there's hooks on these prolegs. Um, they often live in cases that like what I show here, which I'll talk about some more in just a second. And um, some types are free living though. Not all of them have cases, but they can range in size um, quite a bit. Some are quite large and some are teeny tiny. And they're found in many different habitats. So here's some drawings of caddisfly cases. Um, they're so diverse. There's an entire book of caddisflies that you can get with a key, um, with keys throughout, um, because there's just so many of them. Um, and they're just, they will use whatever habitat they live in. They will use things from that habitat to construct their homes, which they, the homes protect them from predators and protect them, protect them from abrasive sand and gravel during high flows or if they're in a fast flowing stream. And the, they also protect them from the current. So here's some real life photos of um, some caddisflies that you'll find in Michigan. Um, this Odontoceridae is pretty unique um, and a really neat picture that a coworker took. The Brachiocentra down here, it has a four-sided case, which um, and it's amazing how, how well it gets the 90 degree order um, angles, I guess. And this one, the Heliocycid is found on rocks and it looks like a little snail shell. So next, um, I'm going to show you a video 
of a caddis fly and their glue. Um, it's a little bit a longer um, video, but um, I think it's worth watching. To us, it's a tranquil mountain stream. But if you're a bug living on those algae-covered rocks in the water, it's a constant underwater hurricane. Powerful currents, debris swirling all around you. How do you survive? Well, you build a shelter. All you need are some raw materials and a little tape. That's right, tape. This is the larva of the caddisfly. This insect has evolved a tool that's eluded us humans so far, tape that stays sticky underwater. As winged adults, caddisflies are a favorite food for trout. Artificial lures mimic them in painstaking detail. But they spend most of their lives as larvae in shallow, turbulent water, which is rich in the oxygen they need. And though its head and legs are covered in a thick layer of insect armor, or chitin, its soft white lower body is more exposed to the elements, and especially to any passing predators. So the caddisfly has figured out how to build a case for ballast protection and camouflage. It does this by binding together pebbles with a special silk that looks and acts a lot like double-sided waterproof tape. Every case starts with one pebble. It's like the cornerstone of a building. The caddisfly adds more pebbles one by one, like a bricklayer putting up a wall using its tape as the mortar. When he brushes the surface with his mouth, that's his tape dispenser working. It's in a gland under his chin. He's sealing the pebble down. These flies are very particular about their building stones. Only the right shape and size will do. If it doesn't fit, it's out. When he finds a match, he fits it into place. Once he tapes down the basic shape of the case, he seals it up from the inside in a series of barrel roll maneuvers. The problem with our tape is that when it's wet, it loses its stick. But caddisfly tape is selective. It sticks to pebbles, but not to water. What's more, the ribbon itself is like a rubber band. It can stretch to twice its size and return to the same shape. But it snaps back slowly it's a rubber band that moves like molasses. So the case is resilient, no quick movements. That's a lot safer for the vulnerable larva living inside. Bioengineers have started to figure out how we could make our own caddisfly silk, maybe as a kind of internal surgeon's tape to replace the metal and string that we use to patch people up now. The magical underwater tape of the caddisfly. Another example of how evolution finds radical solutions to everyday problems, like how to survive in a hurricane. Hi, it's Amy. Look how tiny these guys are. That's what we do at Deep Look. Try to get to the next. We zoom way, way into very small world. There we go. So, some of the um, caddisflies are free living caddisflies, so they don't have cases. They build um, nets with that same strong silk. Um, and those nets are in the water column and they capture things floating downstream and then they eat things that are in those nets. Um, one note about caddisflies when you're preserving them, um, 
the cases can be helpful in identifying them, but as soon as you put them in a jar, um, they will try to get out of their case to escape. Um, so if you put several different kinds in the same jar, it just makes it a little trickier to identify them. It's completely possible, but if I was a volunteer, um, I might try to separate my caddis fly types when I put them in jars. So now we'll move on to mayflies, which I think everybody's familiar with because they will hatch in very large numbers at certain times during the year. And they'll sometimes if you catch them can be found covering cars and buildings, um, gas pumps, um, fishermen love to catch these hatches um, because it tends to be a really good time to go fishing. So mayflies are in the order Ephemeroptera and they have a pollution sensitivity of 3.5, so they're sensitive. Um, they have three tails and long antenna instead of two tails like the stonefly. Um, they have three pairs of legs and they have gills um, that are either feathery or kind of plate-like, but they're always on the abdomen. And they are found in many different habitat types. I have asterisks next to the tails and the antenna because there's always exceptions. No a key is ever perfect. Um, this is a type of mayfly that actually has two tails, but you can see the gills on its abdomen. It's on this lower part, it's not up here. And then a batiscid is a really cute mayfly um, that we don't see a whole, whole lot, but we do see it. Um, but you can't see its gills because it has this little dome shape, kind of reminds me of a, a turtle, like the Ninja Turtles. And here are some um, real life pictures that can show you the diversity of gills you might see. Potamanthidae have these, um, pretty feathery-like gills. Um, cenids have gills that almost don't look like gills because they're underneath these plates. Um, so they're these two square plates. And um, that's how you always know if you've seen a cenid is those two plates. Um, they're also one with triangular plates, but they're a little different. Um, betas are really common. You'll see them a lot. And they have these oval-shaped gills. Um, heptagenids are very flat um, and have gills, a lot, feathery gills as well. And this one's a hexagenia, which many fisher um, people are familiar with because um, many people like the hexagenia um, time of year when they are turning into adults. And this is called an isonicidae. Okay, so now we're going to move on to uh, one of the most visible, I think, of the aquatic insects, um, damselflies and dragonflies. Um, damselflies um, always hold their wings together like this when they're still, where dragonflies will hold them out to the side like airplanes. Um, they both look similar to a dragonfly when they're flying, but when they stop, a damselfly looks um, like this instead. You can almost only see two wings. Um, so I just want to point out that damselflies and dragonflies are in the same order of Odonata, but they are different suborders. Um, the dragonfly as a larva it looks chunkier, stouter. Um, and at its anus, it has these five points where damselflies look longer and skinnier and they have these three um, feathery looking gills at their tails. So we'll focus on the dragonfly first. As I said, they usually have a stout body and they have a labium or I saw um, some places referred to it as a mass which is used to catch prey for their mouth as their mouth part. Um, they have two pairs of wing pads or two pairs of wings. 
Um, they have large eyes, always three leg, three pairs of legs. And again, at the end of the abdomen, they have um, five stiff points, which they will um, shoot water through it to make them move in some cases. Um, it's, they're quite neat to watch. And here is a video of a dragonfly eating. I'm gonna wait and see if it'll load up. There we go. So that little thing it's going after is a Daphnia, which is a type of zooplankton. They're pretty big, so you can see them with your naked eye. But it's using the labium to uh, reach out and grab its prey and they will eat other insects, they will eat um, fish. I've never gotten pinched by one though. This, this, they don't hurt our skin like the megalopterans can. All right. So here's a close up of um, some of those uh, labial palps or labiums that uh, this is one of a um, Cianduranid, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's not correct. So anyway, this one is more cup shaped. This one's flat. Um, they have different shapes, but they are always stout like this. Um, you can see the five points on its end of its abdomen in all cases. And this photo right here is just a picture that a coworker took of a dragonfly coming out of its uh, exuvia. And in a few hours, it'll be dry and flying around. So one of the um, odonates is much more sensitive than the rest. And so um, these you need to mark separately when you are counting your dragonfly larva. Um, as Paul noted in a, his earlier presentation, they're usually pretty easy to, um, to identify. Their labium is really flat instead of cup shaped to like some of those others I was showing you. And then they always have uh, four segmented antennae um, instead of six or seven segments. And they're, um, so they're club like that's where the club tail dragonfly, I think, comes from. Um, they are chunky, chunky antenna. And here is um, some real life photos. You can see the chunky antenna. They're pretty easy to see. Hey, Tamara, let me uh, just say, can you back yeah. up one slide? Yeah. yeah. The other thing, mm -hmm. yep. So <clears throat> chunky antenna, mm -hmm. but also extremely flat antenna, almost oh. yeah, some pancakes almost. So usually just from the antenna shape, you, you know that's what you're dealing with. The others will have like really narrow, thin antenna. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. So chunky wide, I guess, but not chunky width-wise, like yeah. if they're flat. Thanks, Paul. All right, the next order is damselfly and, and um, that's the suborder Zygoptera. And their pollution sensitivity is, um, they're not nearly as sensitive as um, some of the odonates. Um, again, they have a slender body. They have two pairs of wing pads and three pairs of legs. Um, they still have that labial mask, um, but they have three tails or they're really their gills. Um, and so that makes them, between them being really skinny um, and then their three tails, they're pretty easy to identify. Here's a couple, uh, three different examples of ones you might find, what they look like as adults. You can see all of them have, um, they're a little different shapes, but they all have those three gills at the end and they all have those labiums that reach out, grab prey. 
The three tails or gills could be confusing with uh, mayfly species, but the three tails on mayflies are actually tails, they're not, um, they're not gills. The gills are along the abdomen. So you can see this with the damsel fly, they don't, doesn't have those gills along the abdomen. These are the gills. Okay, the next order is Coleoptera or our beetles and their pollution sensitivity is 5.1. Um, they're pretty easy to identify from all the other orders because they have generally have harder bodies um, called elytra. So they, they are crunchier looking <laughs> overall and oval shaped usually. Um, they have chewing mouth parts, which we'll look at in a minute. They have well-developed eyes three pairs of legs that are often very suitable for swimming. So they'll have hairs off of them and look like paddles almost. Um, they're found in many different habitats, but they like slower flowing water and vegetation. And both adults and larvae live in the water, but they look very different from each other because they go through a complete metamorphosis. Um, beetle mouth parts are made for crunching and chewing. Um, so there's many different complex parts. And here are what some of the beetle adults that you might run across look like. Um, the whirly gig beetle is that one you see on top of the water. It's usually with a bunch of others. They come in group really large, you know, hundreds at a time sometimes on the surfaces of lakes or slow moving parts of rivers. Um, the, uh, the riffle beetle is, um, doesn't have like the paddles like the water whirligig does because it crawls along pieces of wood generally. A crawling water beetle um, can swim a little bit, but again, doesn't have like those oar like paddles that some of the others do, like the predaceous diving beetle or the water scavenger beetle. Here's what they look like as larvae, which is, like I said, is very, very different because they go through a complete metamorphosis and have a pupil stage. Um, they're um, very different, um, but uh, they usually um, have antenna that are visible. Um, you usually can see their mouth parts because they're so complex, like I said earlier. Um, they have three pairs of segmented legs that are usually four to five segments each. Sometimes they have these appendages coming off their abdomen um, and, some, and they have hooks at their, um, at their anus sometimes. This one um, is that crawling water beetle. I always think it looks like a porcupine. It's pretty unique. You know usually what it is when you see that one. But uh, confusion with these is expected um, between beetles and some of the um, megalopterans that we talked about at the beginning with the alder fly and the dobson fly. Um, you, they just look very similar. So for one and two, we have beetles. Then we have an alder fly and you can see its mandibles, um, has projections. Um, number four is a Corydalidae, a dapsin fly, and then five is a beetle. So um, even the biologists have a hard time with these sometimes. So I included a um, key for you that a coworker made for all of us to help with um, this. Um, it's not going to be foolproof necessarily, but I do think it definitely helps um, because it's a combination of things that help you identify things. So um, this presentation is really long, but it'll be available to all of you and you can print it out and use it as a resource. You might also confuse a caddisfly larva with a beetle larva, um, but with caddisfly, they often have those hard plates on their thoracic segments where coleopterans don't usually or ever actually. And then um, they have just one claw, caddisfly larva have one claw where coleopterans often have two claws. And then 
the hooks at their anus, uh, there's only two with caddis fly larva where coleopterans will have four if they have hooks. There's, here's the exception, like there's always an exception. This is um, a very unique um, beetle. It's called the water penny beetle. We actually don't see the adults because they're not aquatic. Um, they're found attached to rocks. And like I said, they're pretty unique. Um, everything's kind of underneath this shell. All right, so now we're gonna get into um, a difficult order as Paul alluded to earlier. It's the order Diptera, which are all the flies. There's so many kinds of them and they're all very, very small and they're all soft bodied and worm like, um, don't have any legs, they don't have any wing pads. Um, many of them don't even have a head that you can recognize. Um, and then some of them have fleshy or filamentous things that look like a tail and um, they're easy to miss when you, when. Um, people are picking them. So if when you are training pickers, um, I think probably one of the most important things is to point out to them the very small things because they'll find the big things like the damselflies and the dragonflies, but finding those little worms um, is much more difficult. So on the MyCore list, there's three different groups of um, dipterans based on their sensitivity levels. So we're going to go through um, all three of these different groups together. So one group are the ones that are really sensitive and there's three families that you need to know that are in this um, class. The water snipe fly, the net wind midge, and the dixit midge. We'll go through each of these individually. The water snap snipe fly has a pair of these long terminal processes or tubercles at their end. And then they have all of these little pro legs along their body. Um, they often are green like this, actually. I find them green like this quite often, but not always. Sometimes they're not, they're not that green color. I think it depends on what they're eating and their environment. Um, they're often found in fast flowing water and they burrow um, in gravel as well. Um, the netwing midge or Blephaceridae is actually something I don't think I've ever collected. I think they're, um, when I was looking, preparing for this, it says that they're pretty common, but I don't think I've found them very much or if at all. Um, so, but they're pretty unique looking. So I think if you ran across one, you'd probably be able to identify it, it has um, these interesting suction cups at the um, on every segment. And that's on its underside. The Dixid midge I do see fairly often. Um, they um, have flat um, lobes at their terminal end, at their anus end. Um, and then they also have these little prolegs that actually have hooks on them on their first and second abdominal section. So these first three sections are those thoracic sections. And then after that comes the abdomen. You can see a head um, and they're usually found in shallow or slow water with plants. And when, when um, you're picking them, you actually will find them gen some, usually on the surface of the water. All right, the next, um, group are the ones that are um, not, that are not um, sensitive to pollution. They can tolerate a lot of pollution. So their pollution sensitivity is at the other end of the scale. And these are the mosquitoes, the rat-tailed maggot or hoverfly, and the soldier fly. The mosquito, um, you can see its head. And it has all of its thoracic segments are kind of fused into this like bulb almost. Um, so that's really a good identifying feature of it. 
and then it breathes the air with it with an air spiracle, which is why it's can it's tolerant to pollution. And they're usually found in slow water. Um, a dixid and mosquito look pretty similar to each other, and their sensitivity is very different. So I thought I would um, um, spend a time a slide on this. Um, when looking at them in the pan, the you won't see that bulb, or even when they're underneath, see the, that thoracic fused segment is probably the most um, clear feature on that mosquito. The, the you can even here see those fused fused segments, and then. Also, the dixit has these prolegs, um, which the mosquito does not. The next um, one that's not sensitive to pollution is the rat-tailed maggot, um, which you can't see its head, but it has these weird mouth hooks, at, um, so it's kind of creepy in my opinion. And then it has this really long tail, which is again a siphon where it can um, breathe air. Hey Tamara, like a bee. Yeah, go ahead. Hmm. Yep, you, your your uh, video has frozen. I wonder if you could just stop your video and then start it again, and maybe that will. We can yeah. hear your voice fine. It's just your video. Okay. Can you still see my slides too? Yeah, your slides are still there. Okay. Just that your face is frozen in one spot. But it's it's still thinking about it, so I'll just keep going. Okay, that sounds good. I might leave the video off. Mm -hmm. Um all right. So the next one. Uh oh now everything's frozen. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. All right, the next one is the soldier fly. And it's really unique um, for, it's really unique uh, as well. Um, it's nothing quite looks like it as far as it kind of looks leathery and hard and it's really flat looking. Um, you can see the head. Um, it's usually found in muck. Um, so you won't see it until you get it in the pan usually, um, and it's pollution tolerant. All right, and then there's one more uh, class of dipterins, which is anything else that's not those six that we just went over, not the real sensitive ones or the tolerant ones, they're the in-between ones, but there's three that you will come across most often. Um, one is the black fly, Larva, one is crane fly larva, and one is midges or chironomidae. Black, fly, black flies are pretty cool as larva. Um, they are bowling pin shaped and they stand up in the water um, like a bowling pin that hasn't been knocked over. They have a silk or something that connects them to pieces of vegetation or surfaces or rocks and they um, wave in the um, water column and move these um, bands by their mouth to move food into their mouth. So it's pretty neat um, adaptation that they've developed. And they're often found attached to vegetation or rocks and logs. I find them a lot on vegetation. You can even just wading through, um, or even from bridges, you can see them usually little black flecks on long pieces of like, the green vegetation. Crane flies um, are in the family Tapulidae. Um, you often find these in leaf packs. You can't see its head. Um, its abdomen changes, there's a lot of variation. They can get really large. Um, I always joke with my kids that if you're watching Survivor or something and see them eating some kind of gross worm looking thing, that's probably some kind of tapula because that's what they remind me of. 
Um, some of them have little um, pro legs. Midges are what you'll see a lot of um, when you're looking for the small things. A lot of them will be midges. Um, they sometimes um, are a large portion of a sample. If you're evenly picking the large things and the small things. They're just your common gnat. Um, sometimes they'll look red. Um, those, I think I remember right that they can produce their own hemoglobin, which means they can live in low oxygen environments. Um, their head is usually exposed and they have this little um, thoracic proleg on their first thoracic segment. And then they'll have an anal prolegs as well. Okay, um, the next one is the order hemipterin or true bugs. Um, as we've been joking around, we call a lot of macroinvertebrates bugs, but this is the only one that has a common name of actually true bug. Um, they have a pollution sensitivity of 7.7 .7 on average. Their unique um, feature is that they have piercing or sucking mouth parts. So uh, my understanding is they'll pierce things and they kind of can inject a digestive enzyme and then slurp up their meals. Um, their wings of the, are usually hardened near the base and then their membranous at the tips. So um, unlike a beetle that's hard throughout its um, wings, the, this one has a membranous part. They have three pairs of legs. Um, and unlike the beetles, the adults look the same as the young. They're just smaller versions generally. Um, they're found in many different habitats, but they often like slower flowing water and vegetation. And here is some close-ups of those piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, just a, a moment of caution here. They, they do sting. Um, I've gotten stung only once though in the last 20 years. And it was when I was putting what I had in a net into a bucket and there must've been one right where my palm was, um, but just something to be careful of. Um, the Corixidae has a little bit different mouth part. It's more like a beak. So it's not long and narrow tube like most of them, it's a little different. Um, but Corixids often have these red eyes, so that's um, one feature you can look for. So here are all of the adults. Um, I don't know why, but these are some of the ones that I remember collecting first in my macroinvertebrate class. Um, I think because they're in ponds a lot, because they like slow water, and that was the first thing I started sampling. But this is called a water boatman. Um, this one's called a back swimmer. These are the water striders that you see on top of the water um, in both streams and lakes. Um, this one looks a little like a walking stick, which is a terrestrial type of insect, but um, it's called a water scorpion or a nepidae. And then this one, a bellostomatic, is called a giant water bug. They can get quite large, but um, usually I find them along stream banks or in ponds or lakes. Um, but they can get quite large, so much so that um, I have heard or seen reports of they can eat small ducks or even frogs, but they'd have to get pretty big to do that. I think the biggest I've ever seen is about that big. Or you can't see me right now, so four inches. All right, so now we're moving on to our first order that is not in the class Insecta. This is a, cr a crustacean. Um, an amphipod is um, also called a scud or a freshwater shrimp or side swimmers, um, rightly named because they swim on their side. Um, they're kind of flattened on their side. Um, they have two pairs of antenna and seven pairs of legs. And they're often found in silt or along stream, blank stream banks. Um, I think they're very, they're liked as food for many um, insects and fish. So they're important to the food web. And I put this picture at the bottom because I just thought it was neat. This is like uh, from an amphipod society for the 
for the whole world. So I think these are from across the globe, but there's um, quite a bit of diversity. Um, another crustacean that we will um, identify to order is isopods. Um, they have two pairs of antenna and seven pairs of legs like the amphipod, um, but they're flat and dorsal ventrally. So they don't swim on their sides. They crawl um, and they're flat that way instead. Um, they have leg-like gills on their posterior end and the adults look the same as the young. Um, when they're preserved, uh, Paul tells me that the isopods generally um, are brown where the amphipods um, are white. Um, another crustacean is the decapods or crayfish. Um, I think we're all pretty familiar with these, so I'm not going to spend much time on them, but um, just to say don't collect them. Count them, but don't collect them. They take up a lot of space and um, we're, we are confident that you all know what they look like. Um, so now we're getting to the phylum mollusca. Um, this is the various clams and freshwater mussels, um, the bivalves that we find in our state. Some of them are teeny tiny, like the ones on the left here. Um, they are smaller than my pinky nail. The, the common name for them is pea clams. Or you might find freshwater mussels like the ones on the right, which Paul rec um, noted earlier, we don't um, have a permit to collect these. So if you see them, count them. You don't need to collect them. Um, and also, if you do pick one out of the water, put it back the way you found it. Um, they kind of um, have a hard time if you put them in the sediment upside down. Um, they're many, they're slow growers and many of them are very old and um, they're our special concern and um, endangered ones in our state. So um, place them carefully back where you found them. Don't count the empty shells um, and remember that some of them are tiny. Another mollusk that we um, are counting but not collecting are the snails. There's um, several different types of snails. Um, some of them look like land snails that we might imagine. Um, they're called planorbids. Some of them don't look like snails at all. They just look like little shells but that are stuck to things. They'll stuck, they'll, they will stick to the bottom of your pan when you dump out your pan, you can, that's a lot of times when you'll find the limpets left. Um, we already went over, if you see any New Zealand thing, it, really tiny snails that are in very large numbers and you think they might be New Zealand mud snails to collect them, take a picture and then contact myself or Paul and um, we'll see what we think. And we'll get them to the experts that can really identify them well. Don't count any empty shells and don't collect them, just count them. Okay, now we're get, we're almost, we're in the home stretch. Um, now to the leeches, um, which I think most of you are familiar with leeches as well. Um, they have many, many stri striations. Um, they have two suckers, one in the front and one in the back and they are not sensitive to pollution. Um, they are actually kind of pretty if you get to see them undulating in the water <laughs> instead of sticking to your pan. Um, but I don't think I need to say much more. Oh, um, they, have a, they have two suckers. If you see something with a single sucker, um, Paul indicated that it's possible you might um, confuse it with a sea lamprey and call it a leech. So if it has two suckers, it's a lamp, um, a leech. If it has one sucker and you can see the mouth more easily, it's a lamprey. And finally, uh, you made it. Um, this one's sort of boring. It's uh, aquatic worms. Um, my experience is that after you um, preserve them, they can fall apart kind of easily. Um, they're segmented and they might look like an earthworm, but they also might be real tiny um, and almost clear. Um, 
especially after they get preserved and their pollution sensitivity is 10. So not, not pollution sensitive. Thank you, you made it. Um, congratulations. Again, I hope you've used this as a resource along with those resources I listed. And um, you're always welcome to call me or email me um, if you have questions um, and I will do what I can to help. So we should probably, we have time for questions. There's any in the box. I've been answering some questions as we've as we've gone along. Okay. Um, but if uh, anyone wants to like talk, we can we can unmute you and um, and you can ask a longer question. Um, I know that I think Heather put her hand up but I don't know if uh, she still has that question. So you can, you can type a little bit, Heather, if you, if you still wanted to ask that question or anyone else can, can put their hand up and we can get to you. Paul was right. And this is the part where I wish we were in person and we could look at things together a little bit. But I can go back to old um, slides that were earlier in the presentation too, if you want to talk about something in particular that's always bothered you if you're familiar with these. Nancy asks, did you say we were supposed to collect and keep mud snails if we find them? And I think the, the answer to that is, is yes, because if you feel like you found the New Zealand mud snail then you know we'll want pictures of that and get that confirmed and you know have eagle biologists look at it so yeah so if, if your volunteers feel that they found those they should they should keep them you know those are so tiny if you don't get if you don't find snails that you can't put a hundred on a penny <laughs> then then you don't have a new zealand mud snail uh, i don't think anything else is anywhere close to being as small as those there are some in the same family that are that small, but I have, mm. but but in my case, I'm not really very good at identifying them versus some of the native ones that are that small. So I bring them back, you know, I always bring back 10 or so and give them where we can look at, at them under a microscope. Uh, Patricia asks, uh, what about zebra mussels? Do we count those? Um, yeah, yep, you can, you can count zebra mussels. They have to be alive. But you don't need to collect them. They're everywhere. Yeah, yeah, there's no <laughs> need to collect them. Like I, I said early, in an earlier presentation, the thing with mollusks is, while well, they're very cool and, ha I mean, especially our native uh, freshwater mussels. Um, I even have a whole cool poster of them over here. Um, they're, they're very neat biologically, but they don't necessarily tell you that much about water quality. Um, they're gonna range somewhere between six and eight on terms of tolerance. So they pretty much can live anywhere. <laughs> so they're not really great water quality indicators. They're, they're neat for other reasons. Um, Heather asks, can either of you estimate the amount of time it may take to verify a specimen using the new biotic index taking into account several of the smaller species that may be easily confused with others and they may require the use of a scope? Um, it's really hard for me to answer this question because I can ID all these by sight. Um, so it really just depends on your level of expertise. Uh, you know, you can get to a point where you can recognize them immediately. So it, it, it's not that any of these take that long to do. You just need that constant repetitive practice. I, I, Tamara, I don't know if you could answer that differently. 
Yeah, um, well, I was letting you answer it just because from a volunteer perspective where I'm, you know, been primarily working with um, the other biologists, but we almost always take them back and like you said, look at them under a microscope. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're having trouble with one, um, to take a picture of it and then um, maybe Paul could or myself could help out. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, uh, me and me and Tamara and then Marcy before her are always available to help you with those kind of questions. But I, I have been rarely asked to help identify things historically, and it doesn't have to be the case. <laughs> you know, you can send me you can send me pictures. That actually would be my most favorite kind of email to get. Um. We're asking for a couple people asking about about keys, uh, specifically this new. We have the for those who don't know this this way we're at doing it. The ID now is it's a new system. Um, so I I haven't put together like a laminated um, key yet, like a really simplistic just visual key that volunteers can take out on on the stream with them. Haven't done that yet, but I want to do it this summer. And when that's done, it, it will be put in the stream documents part of our website. So, anything at all. So, not necessarily even this um, particular presentation. But things we have talked about today, um, happy to answer any question uh, from, from throughout the day. Right. Yep, that's right, Pat. You want to get at minimum 60 um, bugs to to do that Hilsenhoff properly. And if you get less than that, then you just follow the directions on the 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 data sheet and it will tell you what what grade it should get. Thanks, Carolyn. Yep, looking forward to seeing you too. Um, Joyce asks, it seemed that we have a hard time getting our pickers to see the small midges and larva. Any clues on encouraging that? <laughs> um, Joyce, find six-year-olds and send them out with your team of retired folk. Because <laughs> it's, it's definitely a thing with younger eyes being able to see different things. Um, another thing is that midges will, will move like crazy. If you get even just a little bit of water into your trays, they will swim. And with that movement, you'll be more likely to find them. And you certainly don't wanna overload trays um, with a lot of muck and heavy debris because that will hinder their swimming. So, you know, separate your samples out into as many trays as you have to uh, get a better look at everything. Uh, Nancy asks, is it expected that IDs be made using a microscope? So that's kind of a preference that I leave up to your ID experts. Um, you shouldn't, um, with enough experience at the order in which, uh, the order of taxa in which we are identifying, you will not need a microscope. Um, However, that, that comes with experience when you are first learning them. I do encourage microscopes because it will help you get to know some of those smaller intricate parts that you're not going to be able to see with your with your naked eye. I am back. Oh, yeah, I'm glad that was at the end. <laughs> your, video, your video was working. Yeah. So are there any other questions after I fell off? Um, yeah, there was some. I, I, I think I answered them all. Okay. Um, let me ask. 
Well, so one thing about expecting to use a microscope, it's kind of interesting the way Eagle does it. Uh, Tamara, I don't, so, you know, it's a little different from the way I'm having my core people do it versus the way you guys do it out in the field. I don't know if you could say a few words about how you as a professional entomologist do a sample. Uh, yeah, just what the differences are. Yeah. Uh, well, we do a lot of our identification out in the field versus bringing them back to the office. And um, so it actually can drive people a little crazy if they're only used to looking them in the, in the lab. Um, some of our new biologists that were, you know, majored in entomology that drives them nuts because they'll say, well, they kind of move like this or they always are like flexing their muscles. You know, we, we, we have kind of this sense of how they move, like dixids will swirl a lot in the water and they have colors to them that you can't see when you preserve them. Um, so I think those are a couple of the, the big differences because we have 120 of them on our list. And um, I'd say at least 100 of them are pretty easily identified in the field. Um, but we do bring them back um, and we're bringing them back, um, I think somewhat in some cases more than we used to because um, we understand that um, there is differences in sensitivity between some of them. Not that our P51 takes that into account necessarily. That's another difference, I guess. It's in, I have used Hilsenhoff biotic index um, myself, kind of trying to use the families that we have collected and see what kind of scores I get. Um, but Procedure 51 is built entirely different based on reference sites and what sites, um, what we collected at those reference sites, um, and then comparing them to other sites within that part of the state. Um, we actually are doing some work this summer. Part of my work this summer is we are um, updating Procedure 51 and getting more reference sites and going and validating those sites. Um, so that's mm. another difference. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. And um, as as a biologist who's used uh, data collected by my core groups before, what are some of the things that these that that these groups can do that, like that would make the data most helpful for for how you would use it? Definitely, going down to family does help um, because there are certain families that we score differently than other families. Um, I'd say even with the old, you know, pr prior to using the Hills and Hoff biotic, I'm kind of interested to see how my use of the data will change um, based on this. I haven't had a lot of time to think about it yet, but the way when it was used to collect it, what I would usually, one thing I used it for is um, like a consultant was commenting on a permit that was coming in that they wanted to, it was a new permittee and they wanted to discharge uh, water to a site. And they said that it didn't have any flow in it, but we had volunteer data that had stoneflies in it. So I knew that just from it having stoneflies that at least at times has flow in it and that it might be a pretty nice stream. So that's how I use the data usually is kind of looking at, is it super poor? Or in the, that case, I was looking and said, oh, well, you found stoneflies. It can't be that bad. <laughs> it yeah. must be pretty good. So those are that's primarily how I've used it. So it'll be interesting, I think, to see um, how we will um, use it now that you're using the HBI method. And then if you do go down to family, if, I, if you say there's a lot of caddisflies, which are pretty sensitive, but you have a bunch of hydrocycids, which is one family, I'll say, well, hydrocycids are pretty, you know, they don't need a lot. They like actually a lot of nutrients. And so um, I wouldn't say that that is that nice of a stream because it's yep. got 50 hydrocycids. Right, yep. Uh, Patricia asks, is there a plan to convert the data that's already on the MyCore data exchange? If not, will that data still be available? Uh, so certainly the legacy data from past sample events will never be 
removed or deleted. It will just stay on the MyCore data site as is. And rep so to give a history for all those sites um, that are in the program. Going forward, we'll have a new data entry portal that, that will allow for this new type of uh, identification scheme. So they'll, they'll be held separate from each other, but all made available. Um, okay, uh, let's just uh, give a couple more seconds. Anyone who wants to have another question, uh, get it in. Otherwise, we'll, we'll wrap up a little early. Um, as a reminder, like we're available for, for emails or uh, other forms of communication uh, to, to answer your questions. Um, uh, Ray Schindler recommends uh, a device called OptiVisors for picking or ID for those of us who are older. So that's a that's a nice device. I, I have a few things like that that basically give you just a constant magnification over your eyes. So as you look down into the, so it's still kind of like doing it's 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 quicker than like putting each individual insect under a microscope, but you still get some magnification. Um, uh, Sally Petrella asks, for disinfection, if the team is doing one side downstream of the other, do we still need to contaminate with bleach in between? And uh, e the answer is, is yes. Just, uh, you know, keep it simple. Let's, um, if we do the same thing every time at every site, uh, it keeps us from making errors. Um, I would also, yeah, I was going to say one thing that I would also add, we, we decontaminate between each site no matter what as well, but we also try to um, plan our sampling so that we um, go from upstream to downstream. So, um, because things move downstream, right? So if there is something invasive at one stream and then you go downstream, if for some reason your decontamination didn't work, it's likely gonna be downstream of that other site anyways. So um, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. plan our sampling that way too. Uh, Joyce asks, uh, well, Joyce says that, that in May, they were still doing the old sampling model. Um, that's fine, you know, I it's still good data it's just a different type slightly of data um and there's no real credit to have i know you guys have a maintenance grant um and yeah i mean yes that that qualifies for meeting some of those those grant requirements so you don't have to worry about me getting heavy-handed just because you're this is the first time we've really introduced this new system i i we created it in the in the winter but never talked about it publicly so Anything you did before is it's fine. I'm, I'm not going to make you re go back and redo those, and it's too late anyway. <laughs> um, one thing I talked about in another presentation that not everyone may have seen was um, uh, how do I go from the old system to the new system? And I think the best way is if you saved your bugs like you were supposed to. Uh, you should be able to rescore your old samples using the new system. It would take a little bit of elbow grease. Uh, you could have volunteers help you. Um, but then your old past samples uh, will, would have that new score. So, and that could be a way of starting to move forward into the new system if, this, if you can regrade some of your old samples, start to develop that baseline data so that you're able to look for trends. Okay, well, thank you everyone for sticking with us. Um, it's been a, I think a good day of questions and presentations. I appreciate the other panelists for, for helping me out. Um, and it was a really interesting Tamara, so thank you. Uh, everyone else, we'll see you on email and phone and hopefully in person someday soon, right?
So take care, everybody. Bye, everyone.